Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Cambridge Partners Masterclass webinar. It's great to have so many of you along today. I'm James Howard, CEO and a financial advisor here at Cambridge Partners. Thank you for joining us today. We will be running a masterclass on evidence-based investing. I'll be joined by two of my colleagues and a special guest from the University of Canterbury that I'll introduce to you shortly. Our goal today is to leave you inspired, informed and enlightened on what evidence-based investing means. This is a key area that differentiates our investment style here at Cambridge Partners from other advice firms. We also want to demonstrate how an evidence-based approach can take the stress out of investing and allow you to focus on the things that matter most in life. Today's webinar will be one hour. We'll have a total of three speakers today and they'll be presenting for around 10 minutes each. Finally, we'll finish up with a Q&A session at the end, provided that we have enough time. Just a little housekeeping before we get going. If you can't stay for the full webinar, don't worry. You can view the webinar on demand via the link you'll get. For those of you that are new to Zoom webinars, firstly, we can't see or hear you, so you're welcome to eat lunch or have a, a cup of tea while we chat away. There's no problem with that. In the panel on your screen, you'll see three boxes, chat, raise your hand, and Q&A. We won't be using the chat or raise your hand buttons today, but if you would like to ask a question, please submit, submit these into the Q&A box, and I'll monitor these as they come through. It's a direct message that only we can see, and if we get a chance, we'll, we'll um, answer them at the end, or we'll get back to you after the webinar if we don't get time to, to ask the question. Okay, now we have to kick off, of course, on our side with a uh, disclaimer. So today's uh, webinar provides general information uh, only and does not consider your personal situation or financial goals and should not be considered personalized financial advice. The opinions of the speakers are their own uh, and past performance is not a reliable indicator of future performance. Well, it is a great um, honour to introduce our uh, panellists or speakers today. Um, we've got a great lineup for you. So firstly, we have Paul Choi. Paul Choi is an advisor here at Cambridge Partners. He has over 14 years experience in banking and financial services and is passionate about delivering quality financial advice. He specialises in personal wealth management and retirement planning. Paul will be providing a background on the history of evidence-based investing. Then we'll have Scott Rainey. Scott Rainey is a principal and financial advisor here at Cambridge Partners. Scott will be a familiar face to you with his regular market updates, the Rainey Reviews. Scott has worked in financial markets for 20 years as an advisor and has a passion for analysis and data. Scott is a chartered financial analyst and today he will be talking about how we put evidence-based investing into practice here at Cambridge Partners. And finally, it's a great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Yinjay Balkowski. Yinjay is a professor of, professor of finance and head of the Department of Economics and Finance at the University of Canterbury. His research focuses on the financial risk management, behavioral finance and investments, including socially responsible investing. NJ will be highlighting what individual investors have to know about themselves before they press the buy sell button. I will now hand over to Paul Choi to kick us off with the hist history of evidence-based investing. Thank you, James. And a warm welcome to everyone streaming into this webinar. I'm Paul Choi, a financial advisor at Cambridge Partners, and it's great to have everyone here. Today, we're embarking on an exploration of evidence-based investing, a discipline that has reshaped our approach to financial growth and how we make investment decisions. But before we dive into the history and influential figures of evidence-based investing, I want to take a moment to appreciate the incredible advancements technology has brought our way. Did you know that the term streaming originated in the early 90s to describe watching videos online. But 
it wasn't until around 2007, with the rise of Netflix, that streaming became a familiar term. Just like how we casually say, Google it, or let's Zoom. We adapt to new tech trends, and the COVID-19 pandemic further boosted our reliance on streaming. But here's the important thing to remember. These changes don't happen overnight. Every advancement we enjoy has a history of brilliant minds and breakthroughs behind it. Speaking of evolution, let's shift our focus back to the world of investing. Picture the bustling streets of 17th century Amsterdam, where the very first stock market was born, thanks to the Dutch East India Company, known for a significant role in global trade and exploration. This market was filled with exhilarating blend of excitement, uncertainty, and ambition. Investing back then combined calculated strategy and a lot of gambling. Information spread unevenly and slowly, so investment decisions relied on intuition, rumors, and a whole lot of luck. Arbitrage also took center stage, rightly or wrongly, where cunning individuals leveraged price gaps for profit. Fast forward to today, where we have regulations, not to mention tons of studies and empirical evidence to support investment decisions, along with quick and accessible information at our fingertips. But even with all this progress, there still seems to be confusion about evidence-based investing. So what exactly is evidence-based investing then? Well, think of it as the intelligent way to manage investments instead of relying on guesswork, picking individual stocks, or trying to time the market, which are all the things that can steer you off course and expose you to biases and needless risks. Evidence-based investing is grounded in academic principles that have been rigorously examined, tested, and peer-reviewed by credible sources. It's a bit like how doctors apply evidence-based practices into their way of working and rely on scientific research and clinical trials to diagnose and provide treatments options to their patients. So our journey into this approach begins in 1952 with Harry Markowitz, a Nobel Prize winner. He introduced the modern portfolio theory, demonstrating that by diversifying investments, we can lower risk while targeting favorable returns. This was a pivotal moment in understanding risk when making investment choices and remains highly relevant today. It underscores the importance of creating well-balanced portfolios containing a mix of stocks, bonds, and other assets to achieve financial goals while managing risk. Jumping ahead to 1964, when another Nobel Prize winner, Bill Sharp, introduced the capital asset pricing model. Now, don't be too intimidated by the name. It's just a way to estimate potential returns from an investment, and investors can use this model to assess whether the potential return of an investment justifies the associated risk. Sharp's work revealed that around 70% of stock returns are influenced by overall market performance. He also introduced the Sharp Ratio, a handy tool to gauge the connection between risk and reward. A year later, in 1965, Eugene Farmer, yet another Nobel Prize winner, came up with the efficient market hypothesis. This idea says that markets are really good at using all the information available to set prices for investments. So trying to always beat the market by picking the perfect stocks or timing when to buy or sell might not be as easy as it sounds. This makes sense, right? Especially nowadays, when we can quickly access information, making the market even smarter and incredibly quick at pricing things accurately. Just think about how effortlessly you can check Apple's share price in real time on your phone. Now, in 1992, Eugene Farmer and Ken French introduced the Farmer-French factor model. 
This model builds upon the capital asset pricing model by considering factors like value, size, and profitability when constructing investment portfolios. It sheds light on how extra returns beyond the broader market can be achieved by factoring in these elements. For instance, value stocks anticipate higher returns over time due to their uncertain growth potential, unlike the growth stocks where its potential growth has already been priced in. Furthermore, the model recognizes that shares in smaller companies tend to outperform larger ones over time. Think of it like some small companies growing into the next big thing. Just like how Google, Zoom, or Netflix I mentioned earlier, started small and became household names. However, not all small fishes become big, and that's the risk. By using this model, we're aiming to capture these different elements into our investments. It means accepting a bit more risk and uncertainty, but it also offers the chance for potentially higher rewards in the long run. The key takeaway from all these studies is the importance of diversification, not trying to time the market, and focusing on improving returns while managing risks. The experts also reminded us to be patient. Even if there are some ups and downs in the short term, sticking to our investments over the long run is likely to lead to good results. In conclusion, as we navigate the world of investing, it's clear that evidence-based investing isn't just a trend. It's a proven way to handle our money based on years of careful research. By following the ideas of experts like Harry Markowitz, Bill Sharp, Eugene Farmer, and Ken French, we can make smart choices using real data instead of just guessing or going with our feelings. Just like how streaming changed how we watch videos and how advances in medicine have saved and improved many lives, evidence-based investing has transformed the way we think about growing our money. So as we all move forward in this investment journey, let's remember what these smart people have taught us and use the power of evidence-based investing to build a brighter financial future. Thank you for listening, and I'll now like to hand over the mic to Scott. Thank you, Paul. Now, I have to say, as a bit of an economics geek, um, I always get a real kick out of hearing about the, I acknowledge, somewhat unlikely looking rock stars of finance and economics. Now, that's all very interesting, I'm sure some of you are thinking, but what does that actually mean uh, for me as an investor? How are those things actually put into practice? Well, that's something I'm going to try and frame for you at a reasonably high level right now. So, at the risk of filling your head with yet more academic names and citations, uh, I'm going to start with the work of Brinson, Hood, uh, Singer and Bebout, uh, of their seminal studies on the determinants of performance. What they found was that 94% of portfolio performance or the variability thereof is determined by asset allocation. That means that security selection, that stock picking, or market timing, picking when to get in and when to get out of markets, determines the other 6% of variability of return. It's actually even more stark than that because on average, security selection and market timing both produced negative contributions to returns. So not only did the contribution they make be, was small, it was also negative. Ouch. So step one of how we put evidence-based investing into practice is to have a strategic asset allocation. Now, the next step, leans very heavily into the work of Harry Markowitz, his mo modern portfolio theory uh, for which he won the Nobel Prize, all about diversification. Now, the total global capital uh, capitalization of markets around the world is over 120 trillion US dollars. Now, for those of you counting at home, there are 12 zeros behind 1 trillion. So that means 120,000 billion dollars of market capitalization. 
Uh, wondering if you are, what New Zealand represents as part of that overall pie? Uh, well, we're not even a rounding error, I'm afraid. 0.2% of total world capital markets is invested in New Zealand. So when we invest for clients, we diversify. Step two, diversify. S&P indices versus active, uh, or SPIVA, uh, shows the performance of active managed funds against their benchmark. Think about active management as security selection, which we already know explains approximately 4% of the variability of returns and happens to contribute negatively, and market timing which again, we also know contributes approximately 2% of the variability of returns and does so negatively. On average, actively managed funds underperform their benchmarks over five year time periods, approximately 80% of the time. And that's the average around the world. Over 20 years, the data is even more stark. In the US, 97% of actively managed funds underperform their benchmarks. Internationally, the number's over 90%. That's a fairly stark and pretty conclusive finding. Step three is to avoid traditionally actively managed funds. This leans into the lessons of that second Nobel laureate that Paul introduced, Bill Sharp. So what is the secret source then of how academic research can be put into client portfolios? Exposure to risk. As Paul touched on earlier, value and small companies have higher expected returns than large and growth companies. It's not free because nothing in investing ever is. It's reward for risk. T here is the total market, V is value, S is small, and G is growth. Growth companies are, by definition, large, uh, and they aren't relatively low priced, i.e. they're high priced. So we know that over time, and these numbers indicate it, that value in small companies outperform growth companies and the total market. The same is true for profitable companies. What this means is that by having exposure to these companies at a reasonably diversified level, always diversify, we can earn higher expected return while managing the risk or variability. Step four, is to have exposure to higher sources of expected return, like value and small companies. That leans into the lessons of that third Nobel laureate that Paul introduced, Gene Farmer, and also, of course, his erstwhile colleague, Ken French. Academics are interested in explaining things. They want economically logical rationales with high levels of statistical significance. Unfortunately, and apologies to Yen Jay for this, they don't always live in the real world. In the real world, things are often scary. Shocks happen and they make it difficult for you to stay in your seat. But this chart shows that there are always exogenous shocks to markets. The world is characterized by risk and uncertainty. Markets are no different. A disciplined investor is able to look beyond the concerns of today and to the long-term growth potential of markets. If they do so, they are rewarded over every time period, every data set we have. Investors who invest for the long-term, that is longer than 10 years, are always rewarded. Step five of how we put academic, academic evidence into effect and practice is to remain disciplined. Unfortunately, uh, and I suspect Yen Jay will comment on this very soon. Investors aren't always very good at following the five steps. So the sixth step, and it's a really important one, I acknowledge the conflict here, is to have an advisor. As investors are human, and humans are emotional beings, the discipline that an advisor provides has demonstrable value. Those of you that have watched us before know that we don't just say things because we believe them. We back them up with data with evidence. That's one of the things I talk about a lot uh, every quarter. Now, Delbar, a financial services research firm, studies how emotions impact investment decisions by studying the timing and flow of investor funds into and out of managed funds in the United States. Based on that fund flow analysis, 
Delbar approximates the return earned by the average investor over this time period of 20 years. Their conclusion? Most investors are bad at market timing, but they do it anyway. Despite strong index returns over this 20-year time period, the average investor has, in, has underperformed a basic indexed 60-40 portfolio by 3.5% per annum. To put that into perspective, on a, on a 100,000 initial investment, that difference, that 3.5% per annum over 20 years, amounts to $170,000. That is, the average investor is $170,000 worse off because of the decisions they made about getting into or out of managed funds. That's a fairly hefty penalty for being human. What this actually shows is that the best way to put academic research into action is by us standing beside you when you're feeling emotional to enable you to make a dispassionate, logical decision. Investing is not necessarily complicated, but it is hard. So in our opinion, the most important step for how to put academic research and evidence into practice is to manage you, the investor. So thank you very much for listening. It is now my pleasure to hand over to Yin Jay from the University of Canterbury. Hey, thank you very much. And it is a real pleasure uh, to pick up uh, the topics now after um, Scott and, and Paul. And I will talk about also research and I will talk about the research and people's emotions. So let me start the screen, start this, share the screen. Um, And so here is uh, my, uh, my slide with uh, title, Behavioral Finance and Stock Market Performance. And here we go. We have a sleeping uh, pattern, Bioret patterns, uh, a soccer ball. And somehow I will argue that they have uh, uh, impact or at least they have an impact via investors on the Wall Street. So let's start it. So uh, 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 Scott and Paul talk about the, the classical finance, the classical theory of finance. And this classical theory uh, is something which we teach at the university. It is a core of our, our, our curriculums. But nevertheless, this theory have a very little to say about the reasons behind why individuals uh, uh, trade and why they trade so much. Uh, uh, th they have little to say about performance of the investment of individual investors not supported by uh, advisors. And why do stock returns vary across uh, for reasons other than the risks? Okay, so we, uh, 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 Paul and Scott mentioned this, uh, uh, remind you actually about the relationship between the risk and return, and the re return is the reward for a risk. But we actually observe in the real world that returns varies for a reasons other than a compensation for a risk. Uh, and what are the key uh, academic results in classical finance? Portfolio should be chosen based on the mean variance optimization. We should up, uh, implement diversification. And riskier stocks measured by the volatility or beta are expected to deliver the great returns. Uh, however, the finance, particularly the behavioral finance, can be more useful if it shades a specific light on active investing. And we would like to know what mistakes are common among the individual investors, what strategies adopt to be in a green with our investments. And the answers for these questions, at least partially, are given by behavioral finance. So behavioral finance uh, take into account uh, uh, question, uh, one of the assumptions which was made in a, in a previous, uh, uh, in a classical theory of finance, 
basically a behavioral finance question the rationality of investors. It's take into account the fact that investors can be rational and ask what are the consequences of it. So what I am going to discuss, actually, I'm going to touch on, on, on it. I will talk about psychological bias. I will talk about anomalous individual investor behavior. And I will talk about some anomalies which are present on the stock market. And, you know, little cartoon on the right hand side give you the indication about, you know, how uh, how uh, performance of the markets can be uh, can be related to behavior, uh, human behavior. So what are the psychological biases? So these are the biases which investor has and they affect their performance. So, so one of them is a confirmation bias. So it's a tendency to find the explanations that allow you to maintain self-esteem. So example of it, you try a market, uh, um, um, timing the market, you fail, as statistics tells you that you most of the cases you will fail, but you will find an uh, explanation why actually you fail and the explanation is beyond you so it's not your fault it is something external to you and you would like to do it because you would like to feel good about your action another bias which is uh, quite common is a representative bias and it is mass uh, miscalculation probabilities based of one's pre-assumption about what type of uh, individual uh, or event belongs to the certain categories and and the most um, um, uh, a stunning example of representativeness bias is that investors seems to use the recent past as a best predictor of the future. And uh, in other part of, of finance literature, academic literature, we find a lot of evidence that, you know, post, the, post crisis, people are prepared to pay most for insurance against the next crisis. During the booming market, the, the one last thing which investors think is that the market can revert to its mean. Uh, <clears throat> and then you have availability bias, and it is a tendency to overweight dramatically and uh, easily uh, recalled items. So here again, that there is a, a situation that investors have uh, uh, individual investors have a good memory about 2008, uh, 2001. So dot, dot bubble crisis, uh, global financial crisis, uh, uh, performance of the market around the COVID. And they use this, this, this to some effect, they judgment a lot beyond uh, uh, how much it should be necessary. And finally, there is an overconfidence uh, that investors are overconfident and they have a, a quite nice um, um, uh, cartoons which illustrate overconfidence and also representativeness bias. So in one of this cartoon on the left hand side, you have uh, basically individual investors who are surprised to meet another individual investors. And it's referred to the fact that if you uh, survey individual investors, more than 50% uh, of them believe that they are better than 50% of other investors. Clearly, it is, uh, it is statistically impossible. Second, you have the uh, bull market uh, uh, on, uh, on, a, on a scene and uh, investors uh, shout encore, encore, because they expect that bull market will continue. However, the bear market is uh, just waiting on a, on a corner. So just an illustration of psychological bias. Another uh, 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 bias or uh, effect which I want to mention related to the behavioral finance is this position effect. And this position of effect is to, a tendency to sell winners too soon and hold to losers too long. Uh, and it is consistent with uh, the idea that investors um, feel good about reali realizing the, the gains and feel bad about uh, selling the, the stocks which are the purely uh, really underperformance, there are arguments to, to, to sell it because it's the fact of means uh, accepting the fact that they made a mistake by investing in it. And um, 
What is actually interesting is that those those winners, uh, which are sold too early, often perform, uh, have the continuation of good performance. And the, the companies which were losers and were should be removed from the portfolios, they continue their uh, trip to south. And here is actually the illustration which shows the ratio of uh, uh, proportion of re realize, uh, proportion of gain realized to the proportion of uh, losses realized. And in ideal world, it should be actually uh, steady, but here we uh, see uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, that this ratio is higher, higher than one here. And we also see how it changed over the year, over, over uh, during the year. Now, this is something which I think uh, is very important, and I would like to highlight it this, um, because this is a, a very strong result. So I refer here to Baber uh, and Oden uh, study from 2000. And what actually this graph presents, this graph presents gross return, net return, so this is a return after taking into account the cost, and the turnover, so uh, amount of activity of the investor. And it is done for individual investors. So what you see, I divided, the, 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 they divided the investors into five groups. Those who trade very little and those who trade very lot, so, a lot. So this is this gray bar. And I hope you realize that when you increase the number of trading activity, Please notice what happened between the distance between those two bars. Pretty much the distance between uh, white bar and black bar become bigger and bigger, which means that actual return generated by high activity of investor, individual investor, uh, uh, by being highly active, they are killing their returns. Because at the end of the day, we, you know, for what matter for investors is net, net, uh, net, uh, net return rather than gross return. Okay, so important lesson, uh, you know, uh, being too active on your platform, especially which which offer you the leverage, is a great way of reducing your wealth. But this uh, this uh, uh, this study have a follow up, and it has a split. And this is actually a very interesting split between women and men. Uh, and uh, you know there is uh, there is there is no there is not much difference here. The the women and men perform pretty much badly in terms of uh, as a, as a individual investors. But there is a factor which further reduces performance of of uh, males uh, portfolios. And it is related to the overconfidence. Uh, so, you know, men uh, generally, uh, as a as a um, as a gender, we are sp uh, we are characterized by overconfidence. This overconfidence leads to the heavier trading, and this heavier trading again negatively impact our wealth. Even more, if you have access to the platform and you use you can trade on platform you further increase the number of trading activity and it it's affect your performance so here is a uh, um, um, slide from a study of the baber and Oden, and it shows trading activity all men all women single men single women single men and what you observe, first of all, is that men trade more than women, and generally being single uh, create incentive to trade more, or you know, slightly more, especially for for males, which uh, again uh, uh, is in line of what I uh, indicate first. It has the impact on uh, performance, and here is the result of a performance. So I have. All women, all men, single women, single men. And the result, uh, the conclusion from it is that single men, because they trade too much and uh, too often, and they use the online tools, they, uh, they, <laughs> they, they have a negative impact on their wealth. 
Okay, now let's talk about return anomalies. And this is something uh, particularly interesting. Uh, I have a, a contribution in this literature. Uh, so uh, it's a topic close to my heart, but it's also a topic which is important for individual investors. So what are the return anomalies? So return anomalies are in principle situations that the, the phenomena on the market uh, that we observe certain pattern of returns which cannot be explained as, as a compensation for a for a exposure to the risk. Okay. So, for example, if we observe higher returns and there is no exposure to the higher risk, this is anomaly. Okay. Independently how you will measure uh, uh, the the risk and return here. And here a couple of anomalies. So. Uh, Kamaster, Kramer, and Levy 99 showed that switch to from uh, daily saving time have a strong impact on the stock market. It has a very short living impact on the stock market. So basically, when you lose one hour of a sleep, next day, the, the stock markets uh, underperform because the sleep matters for your, uh, for your well-being. Short living effect, but effect which... Uh, uh, was supported by a few studies um, and also attracted a lot of debate in the market. Then you have uh, Bannon and Jacobsen, which shows a strong uh, seasonal effect, which is no known as a, a Halloween effect. Uh, then there is Adams and Ali, which show that sport results have a short-lived effect beyond the uh, compensation of, on a risk. So uh, uh, it was related to the international soccer games, the stock markets after the, uh, you know, when you have a game of two, two countries and the country which win, and it is international important game, the market in the next two days in this market perform better after controlling. And then my study with Etabari and Wisniewski shows that uh, there is something which is uh, known as a Ramadan effect, and namely uh, in a period um, uh, of uh, holy month of Ramadan, the stock market perform much better despite of the fact that there is no higher risk. And here is a, a presentation of a, of a graph which uh, illustrates anomalies at Halloween effect. So it shows for each market, the black bar shows the nor Northern Hemisphere winter market and the white bars corresponds to the summer market, so how performance of the market in the summer. Uh, then there is the effect of, of a Ramadan, which is my, my own research. And uh, please don't be too excited. Those returns are on annual basis. And we observe that the, in Muslim countries during the Ramadan, the market performed particularly well. And we do not observe increase of the risk which is against a classical theory of finance. Okay, so let's get to some conclusions and some, um, uh, some uh, food for thought. So we should, as individual investors, uh, 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 avoid trading too frequently both based on the short-term trends. We should avoid being carried away by fads and frenzies. We should plan on being disciplined enough to place defensive bet at hedger at the bear, uh, bear market and aggressive bets at in a bull market. And again, the advice uh, of someone who knows how to do it will be uh, necessary. Be mindful of psychological bias while you evaluating investment. Don't think that you are better than other investors. Think about yourself that you are probably uh, uh, not as good as uh, um, median investor. And take into account the important factors such as uh, 12, six months performance, level of a trading and structure of owner, uh, ownership as, as an example. So this is, that's it from me. And I am passing to James. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Yinje, and also thank you very much, Scott and, and Paul, for um, uh, for taking us through the history uh, of 
evidence-based investing, um, you know, how we implement evidence-based investing and then some of the behavioural uh, factors that we need to consider as, as, as investors when it comes to investing. So I'd, I'll now move on to some Q&A. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come in already, so please, um, uh, if you want to ask any questions, you can put them into the Q&A uh, box now and, and they can either be general or directed to um, one of our panellists. Uh, just to reiterate, we cannot provide personalised financial advice on this webinar. Um, so if it is a question we can't answer directly uh, on the webinar, then we'll come back to you um, later on. So it's definitely not too late to get a question in if, if you've got one. Um, but, but I'll kick off with one for you, Yinjay. Um, one of your recent uh, pieces of work or, or research works, and, and one that uh, specifically piqued my interest, um, uh, looking through was one you co authored about US midterm elections and, and stock returns uh, or the midterm election effect. And I know from, you know, being an advisor and in particular having a number of US clients, you know, elections are definitely one of the topics that comes up around, um, you know, stock market returns and, and what's going to happen. And it resonated with me because, uh, you know, elections are one of those things that typically attracts a lot of media attention. And often there's a lot of um, emphasis by those market commentators on connecting, you know, stock markets and, and performance, both, you know, what's happening currently and what might happen in the future to the election, um, you know, what's happening in the election and what that potential outcome of the election may be. Um, or in other words, sometimes what we call media noise, you know, a lot of media noise around it. So a question for you, Yinje, I guess, in considering investor behaviour, what should investors be aware of when we see media covering investment markets in, in, in general and commentary? And, and how should we let the media influence our behaviour? Sorry, I think you're... It is actually a great question. Thank you, James, for it. For it. I, uh, it is actually amazing. Uh, uh, and I... I each time when the market is going down, I or, or each time when there is some new 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 information on the market, which seems to uh, have a ne potentially negative impact on the market, I I love to follow the media, and there is a couple of things which uh, a couple of observations which I can make. First of all, the media report. Uh, mm, any of those information which are important for a market with a delay. So when they really uh, report it, the, the thing that the, the, you know the, there is a milk milk is already on the table. You know there is <laughs> so um, in this sense the the information uh, which appear in the media should not be used as a trigger to the uh, to the. Um, trading to the changing your trading pattern or to you know implementing a new strategies it is generally too late uh, and what I also find uh, um, um, across the different markets uh, in different countries this delay between uh, news and uh, the actual event and how it is reported is different so it even in other countries, you, the further you are away from the United States, this, this delay is further, is bigger. So investors should remain cool. And remember that, you know, when you will see those uh, uh, headlines, the stock market is crashing, the biggest crash since, uh, and here they usually use a previous crash, uh, you should remember that uh, it is not a signal for you to trade and you should uh, stay cool. Thanks, Yinjay. Important message, and and you know we we tend to see the media as well like to uh, report and and present on uh, negative um, occurrences and markets, and they seem to ignore the positive ones. Uh, so the the red gets more clickbait or, or audience uh, members. All right, okay. Paul, I I have a um, question for you. In your experience as a financial advisor. What do you see are the outcomes for investors that follow an evidence-based approach rather than, say, a more active approach? Well, that's a good question, James. Um, 
Well, we spent about what over 40 minutes trying to, um, I guess, explain why evidence-based investing is important. And with Dr. Uh, NJ explaining the behavioral um, things that we do, but so I'll keep it a bit higher level and make it more relevant to, to, to your question. So I guess it's that, first of all, less distraction and a lot more peace of mind. The reason I say those two things is that, and, and I, perhaps I can use a, an analogy that I use often with my clients, is that think about when you plan for an overseas holiday, right? You need to fly, obviously, to New Zealand, being land, um, you know, being landlocked, but um, you need to fly to a destination. Now, you can try to go and learn how to fly the plane and then try to, you know, do all that, but most people aren't interested or have the skill set to do that. And more importantly, it's time consuming. So what we want to do is just focus on for investors to actually focus on the things that are important to them. And that is, you know, who are they going to go with? Um, you know, how long are they wanting to go there? How, you know, when do they want to get there? And ultimately, what destination they want to fly to? And delegating the rest of that to, you know, and choosing an airline that not just, you know, has the best um, pilot, one pilot that has the, the you know, X-Fighter jet that they can, you know, maneuver all these things. You want a reputable airline that has, you know, a structure in place that that all of the pilots are, are qualified and that they can actually take you to your destination um, through all the turbulences because we all know that, you know, when you fly, there will be turbulences. And we don't know when, but if we, you know, if we don't expect, you know, if, if you don't expect that there'll be turbulences when you're flying, um, you know, you've obviously haven't flown before. So that's, yeah, I, I guess that's quite a good analogy to use when you're thinking about, you know, your own investment um, decisions or investment planning. You can just focus on those important things, which is making sure what are those financial goals or life goals and, uh, you know, finding the right investment vehicle to get you there. Thanks, thanks, Paul. And and as you say, it's easy to to stress about a flight, uh, you know, before you go away on holiday, and then you get there, and you always wonder what you were worrying about. So uh, enjoy the enjoy the journey, and and um, and have the right destination is always a, a key message. Scott, there's a question that's come through uh, for you uh, to to answer. Um, so you provided evidence that value in small companies outperform the total market index and growth index. Do you see value investments continuing this outperformance in the future? That's a really good question. Um, the short answer is yes, but I don't want to be flippant and leave it there. So if we step back, the reason that value and small companies outperform large and growth companies is because of risk. Uh, it is reward for risk. So unless that fundamental nature of relationship between risk and return has changed, then as long as that risk is there, the expected return must be there to incentivize investors to take that risk. Uh, now, because it's risky, that doesn't mean that it's there every year. So from time to time, there will be periods where value and small companies out underperform. So for example, year to date, you may have heard of what, uh, what's been termed the Magnificent Seven. The, that, so that's uh, Meta, uh, Facebook, Google, so Meta is Facebook, Meta, Google, Apple, NVIDIA, uh, Twitter. Uh, all these companies that have exposure to AI have done really, really well. In fact, they have delivered 58% for the six months to June. That's a big part of the S&P 500. So sometimes that can happen. Conversely, uh, when markets didn't perform well in the 2022 calendar year, value really outperformed. Uh, so yes, I expect to see those relationships continue over time. What is important is that how we uh, blend those value and small company exposures with the overall market to ensure that we get a lower risk approach to taking risk, which is the only thing that generates return. Thanks, Scott. And, and hopefully that's that's answered the um uh, the the question and and I think the the big part that plays in that which Paul mentioned earlier on is diversification. 
and the application of diversification across everything we everything we do in order to um, to to reduce that uh, reduce that risk. Um, and another question, just while we're with you, um, Scott, you know, one of the comments NJ made uh, in his in his um, during his presentation was trading is ha hazardous to your wealth, which I thought was a really cool statement. Um, and, and as we see, very much true. How does Cambridge Partners manage this practically? Again, that's a, another really good question. Uh, look, the reality is that um, our job is, as I indicated when I spoke, to keep investors in their seat. Um, generally speaking, I can tell you with a high degree of probability what your investments are likely to do over the next 100 years. As that time frame gets shorter, uh, the level of certainty or expectation of a particular number um, gets a lot more variable. Uh, so one of the things that we do is that we uh, invest clients' funds in funds that don't trade a lot, because as NJ said, uh, trading is tra is hazardous to your wealth. Um, you know, typically, it means uh, it leads to you uh, uh, selling low and buying high, uh, because that's emotionally how investors react. So A, we invest in funds that um, don't trade a lot. B, uh, when we set our strategic asset allocation, we don't vary it a lot. You know, we do a lot of work on that uh, on at least triannual basis. Um, and when we make changes there, we only think about making changes if there's likely to be a net expected gain uh, to clients after trading costs. And the third way that we consider that is that we look to manage those costs in a tax efficient way, because that can really matter as well. Perfect, thank you again, Scott. I'll, I'll come back to Yin Jay and I've got a question um, for you, Yin Jay, and, and the, the piece that you uh, sort of spoke a little bit about was overconfidence. And there's a common comment that's come through uh, with a, a smiley face afterwards and a question mark that said, so does that make women better investors? And um, I'm very much reminded about another analogy uh, that, that can be used in this situation where you get a group of people in a room and ask you know, them to rate their own driving compared to everyone else. And every single time you do it, the majority of the room uh, thinks that they're a better than average driver, which we know statistically is not possible. Um, but the same, uh, the same outcome applies to, to investing just purely based on on the numbers. So I guess in, in talking about overconfidence, what can investors do to manage that overconfidence? And what are the things that they can do knowing that, um, I guess, as, as you mentioned, and as Scott mentioned a little bit as well, that emotions can take over um, during times because we're dealing with our own, uh, you know, our own money, our own wealth? Well, I, I think... Uh... <clears throat> They, they can do at least two things. So the first thing is uh, uh, use their own experience. So keep the track of of their uh, past trades. So, so you know, despite of the fact that uh, Cambridge Partners uh, can give the best advice possible to, to, to your clients, anyway, they will trade by themselves. They will implement the trades or they did this before. And one thing which is uh, which is a human nature is that we remember the successes and we somehow put uh, put the failures in you know into attic and we close them in a, in a box and we forget about them. If the investors remember about their failures and embrace them, they will draw the proper conclusions. Okay, so so this is the, the first thing. Then the second thing is, um, if you, you know, if you are, uh, you know, overconfidence generally apply mostly for male. You know, it is it's a biological thing, and you know, if you if you look on the number of uh, uh, horrible um, accidents which happened to teenagers. Mostly they are boys, and this is coming from the fact that, that males are biologically more overconfident. So, how to deal with it? You know, um, it, this because this is applied particularly to to males. Discuss this idea of, of a trade with your with your spouse. You know, this you know have the conversation about. It. 
use you know balance your overconfidence with uh, with a careful planning which is uh, which is part of a, a woman's nature you know and of course uh, one thing which i really you know there was some comments that uh, does it mean that women are better investors no there is no evidence that women are better investors women generate higher returns because they trade less you know this is this is pretty much and they trade less because they mm, engage less in in a, mar a market uh, timing of a market perfect thanks thanks inj and i think uh, yeah i completely agree with the message there it's about making informed um decisions you know that that are based on on facts and what you know at the time and and a long term plan is is the best way for you to um uh, to to progress forward in in, in a positive uh, positive way all right, we've got time for one last uh, question, and I'll direct this one at you, Scott, so you get the the nice uh, gnarly one to finish. Right. Um, but what is the typical change in results when clients move to an evidence based approach from a more traditional approach? Well, that is a gnarly one. Thanks, James. <laughs> uh, look, so I'm going to uh, start this like an economist would by saying it depends. So it, it does really depend on the nature of the change and the level of risk, but uh, holding those things equal, uh, one of the things that we can almost guarantee will happen is that our clients will trade less, so they will experience less trading costs. Uh, our clients will have exposure to small companies and value companies over time, uh, blended with large company exposure as well, so they will, ex they will have exposure to higher expected returns. Now, over the long term, uh, both trading less and having exposure to higher sources of expected return will lead to a superior net outcome. Uh, over the short term, it might not always be the case. So I, I, I can say that look, over 10 years, we would expect our portfolios to outperform for those two reasons, trade less, exposure to higher sources of expected return. But the, regrettably, there is no typical situation because every situation depends on an investor's beginning portfolio uh, and the risk level that they take. And that's a, that's a good summary, Scott, and a good caveat at the end because it, at the end of the day, what's important to one investor uh, is is not important to another and, and vice versa. And, and the most important thing an investor can do is have a plan that clearly outlines what they're trying to achieve, you know, over the mid and, and long term and, and have an investment strategy that supports that and allows them to focus on the things that are important to them and, and the outcomes that they're trying to achieve in, in the long term. Well, look, that's all we've got time for today. Um, thank you so much, everyone that's joined the webinar or maybe watching us um, on replay. Uh, in particular, a special thank you to our guest today, NJ from the University of Canterbury. We really appreciate your time uh, in, in coming on this webinar and, and um, presenting, but also a big thanks to Paul and Scott for your time as well. Um, if you'd like to have any further information, please drop us a message at info at cambridgepartners.co.nz or please feel free to reach out to your advisor um, as well with any further information or questions that you may have. Uh, we'll be sending out a replay of the webinar tomorrow afternoon as well and please feel free to forward it on to anyone you might know that, that will be interested in, in watching. Thank you once again. Have a great day. And we'll hopefully see you all shortly. Matiwa. Thanks, everyone.